goodness. Thank you so much. Well, <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> it's been one week and it is uh, the new era of provincial politics here in Alberta. We have entered the Smith era and we decided on the cross-border interviews with Chris Brown to bring back our friend from up in Edmonton, Dave Cornier of Dave Berta podcast of Dave Berta Substack to talk about the last week in politics and the unexpected expected uh, win from Danielle Smith at the UCP leadership race. Dave, thanks so much for doing this. Thank you so much for having me on, Chris. I'm excited (laughs) to talk. There's so much to talk about. (laughs) <laughs> so it has been one week. This is airing on Friday, but last Thursday, Danielle Smith claimed victory after six ballots. You and I had chatted about a week and a half before, and we were not expecting this to not go this way. Were you shocked that it took six ballots? Uh, I mean, it was one of those things where she was either going to win it on the first ballot or she was going to win it on the fifth or sixth ballot, probably. Um, uh, because if she didn't have enough votes to to sweep the first ballot, she was going to have to wait till candidates like Todd Lowen or even Brian Jean dropped off to collect their second place votes. Cause there was this kind of group of, of candidates who placed, uh, well, I guess six, seventh, eighth, and ninth, or pardon me, pardon that seventh, eighth, seventh, fifth, sixth, and seventh, I should say, um, you know, the Rajan Sani's, Leela Heers, uh, Rebecca Schultz, and, and their votes were not really going to go towards Smith. So she really needed votes, second place votes from people like Todd Lowen who is running on a very similar platform and appealing to very similar conservatives, UCP members. Um, so she needed those second place votes to put her over the top. And then it turned out that that wasn't enough, that she needed some of Brian Jean's voters to second place uh, choices to put her over the, over the top in the end. Who would have thought Brian Jean, the f- person who came in second in the 2017 leadership, would ultimately play kingmaker in this leadership race. Did you expect this going into that night? Because I can imagine the love-hate relationship that Brian Jean and Danielle Smith have that I couldn't imagine him wanting to be in that position. Well, I think they were, they campaigned, they did campaign on some similar issues when you're talking about autonomy. I mean, autonomy for Alberta was Brian Jean's slogan, and that fits kind of well into the Alberta Sovereignty Act kind of category when you're appealing to those voters who feel those types of issues are really important. Um, I was looking at a, a chart that uh, Trevor Toome from the UFC posted right after, and it was a, basically like a flow chart. I forget the I forget what the the term for the chart is, but it was basically a flow chart showing you know who's second, which candidates' second place votes went to which other were redistributed to other candidates as this as the ballots went on and on. Uh, and looking at Brian Jeans, uh, you know more of his second place votes went to Travis Taves than Daniel Smith, and a big chunk of his votes actually just went nowhere. So there were a whole bunch of people who voted for Brian Jean as their number one choice, and that's it. And maybe they voted for one of the other candidates who'd already dropped off as their second place candidate, or maybe they just voted for Jean. Uh, but there was a pretty significant drop off uh, in uh, from, from Jean, so it's of, of people whose votes weren't redistributed to uh, to Daniel Smith or, or Travis Taves. And uh, you know, it turned out that there just weren't enough second place vote votes for uh, for for uh, Travis Taves among Brian Jean voters to put him over the top. But I know that there was some like it. It seemed pretty clear that the, that Danielle Smith had the momentum, and that a lot of second place votes would have to go to Travis Taves for him to to get over the top on the sixth ballot. Um, but it did seem that you know, I mean, he was gaining Taves was gaining some support on the fourth and the fifth ballots, uh, and it looked like. You know, if if there had been a you know a significantly a significant more number of a larger number of of second place votes from Brian Jean, maybe uh, maybe that would have been enough. But in the end, it it wasn't. And I think that the uh, I mean, Taves just he started off so far behind that it would have been it would have taken something momentous for him to uh, to be able to uh, to get over the top in the end. We are one week to quote bare naked ladies. It's been one week since that faithful night, and uh, well. We're looking at a new era of provincial politics in the province of Alberta. You have been covering politics for some time now. Um, this premier uh, elect, when she was first, uh, when she went up on stage as premier designate, sorry, she started her speech with I'm back. We are in a Smith era. You have covered politics for a long time. 
is this a unique time to be in politics in the province of Alberta for you and for, well, residents? Every year is a unique time to, to, <laughs> be, to be covering Alberta politics. I mean, it seems like every year. I mean, this is this is uh, especially unique. I mean, the the, uh, the comeback of the year eight years ago when Daniel Smith uh, led uh, uh, half a dozen or eight or so of her Wild Rose MLAs to cross to uh, to join Jim Prentice's PCs. Uh, you know that the the forward crossing that went over like a ton of bricks with with, with Albertans and uh, it looked like at that point that uh, and and the ensuing election and her losing losing the PC party nomination back in in ahead of the 2015 election it looked like her political political career was over um so yeah this is i mean it's it's not surprising if you've been paying attention to the UCP leadership race because it's a, it's been pretty clear for months that she's been the front runner it's been pretty clear for months that she had a really good shot of winning uh, but uh, but it is a big comeback, um, and I wrote on my uh, on my on my blog the uh, last week with the night that she won that this you know this is the biggest comeback of the year, but it, it it'll only be uh, only be uh, superseded if uh, if Rachel Notley is able to uh, come back as pre as premier in twenty twenty three. That'll be the only bigger comeback uh, that I could that I could think of uh, in uh, in Alberta politics. So we have had one week, and we have had a lot of things happen in that week. Uh... Uh, I forget how to pronounce. I forget her name. MLA for Brooks Medicine Hat. You'll probably be able to quickly Ma say her. Ma Michaela Frey. Michaela Frey announced on the Friday, like literally the day after Danielle Smith won, that she was stepping down for Danielle to run in. She had already announced earlier on in the well summer that she wasn't going to be standing for re-election uh daniel smith officially announced that she was going to run in that by-election and leave the by or the open vacancy uh in calgary elbow vacant until the next election and there would be a steward which we can talk about what the heck that word means for time and time to come but uh tyler shander would be the steward of calgary elbow um okay i'm gonna be honest here it's her prerogative to call whatever by-election she wants, right? She has the right to do it. In 2015, there was a vacancy on January 2nd with uh, Stephanie McLean, former NDP MLA for Calgary Varsity. She left. The, the, the seat left vacant for six months until the next election. Daniel Smith can do whatever the heck she wants, right? This is, should not be a big story compared to what it is right now, should it? Or am I just reading less into the or more into this than I shouldn't should be? Well, I think the issue is that the seat, the Calgary elbow seat has been vacant for already for a month or just a little bit over a month when Doug Schweitzer resigned. So I think that there's, you know, there's some issue around letting this seat be vacant for the next seven months until the next election. I mean, I think the, the, the election starts in six and a half or seven months is when, when it's supposed to happen. If it, if, if it is called, if she, if the premier does call it at the end of May when it's scheduled to be. So, um, yeah, I think you know the opposition will make some make some hay of it, and it you know it was a seat that was held by a different party. It was held by the Alberta Party going in, into the twenty nineteen election. Uh, they seem to be trying putting an effort in, try really to try really hard with it with their candidate to to uh, to get a seat back. The NDP have been putting a lot of energy into it. They have a candidate who's nominated there who seems to be uh, pretty credible and has been out campaigning. Um, and if Calgary is competitive in the next election, Calgary Elbow will probably be competitive in the next election. So I can't imagine, you know, having <laughs> having so much media attention uh, about the, uh, the about the seat being left vacant. Uh, in Calgary Elbow, while the premier calls a, a by-election in a safe seat in Brooks Medicine Hat, I can't imagine that's great or going to be great for the whoever the UCP candidate is who's nominated in Calgary Elbow. Um, I mean, it's it appears the, that they didn't. The UCP don't have a candidate right now, right? You you track no. these things. They don't have someone yeah. who is coming. They, they have. Yeah, from what I understand, they have two candidates who are. Uh, announced who are running for the nomination, Andrea James, who's a lawyer, and uh, uh, Jim Horseman, who ran for the, briefly ran for the UCP leadership. He's announced he's running in that. Uh, Tim. Or, it, pardon me? Tim Horseman. Tim, is it Tim Horseman? Is it Tim Horseman? It's Tim Horseman. Okay. I was like, okay, Jim, Jim Horseman. Horseman. What? Sorry. <laughs> Yes, him. He he ran for about five seconds. He was in the in the UCP leadership race. He's a former bank vice president and uh, and financial services guy. Uh, he's announced that he's running for the uh, UCP nomination in, in Calgary Elbow. And I mean, if they were to have a nomination race, um, it, you know, if the premier didn't simply appoint a candidate like we've seen in previous previous uh, times where they've called 
by-elections very quick, like thinking about when Jim Prentice called a set of four by-elections in 2014, he had uh, two people already lined up for two of those by-elections. He had uh, Gordon Dirks, who was the appointed to cabinet and ran in Calgary Elbow, and Stephen Mandel, who was also appointed to cabinet and ran in, in Edmonton White Mud. Uh, it doesn't seem that Daniel Smith really had anybody lined up like that to run and getting, you know, a big candidate ready to, to just jump into a, into a riding like that. Um, and nomination races do take time. I mean, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to justify not calling it, but you know, if you're going to have a nomination race and if there are, uh, you know, a number of people running one who want to run for a nomination, you're talking about probably four to six weeks to, uh, to get that process done. So by the time four to six weeks comes along, um, the, uh, you know, the, the window is closing. We're already six and a half months, seven months away from the next election. Uh, you know, I can, I can see how they came to that conclusion. Politically, I don't really think it's, you know, it might not be a smart choice politically, but, uh, but I can see how they came to that, uh, how they came to that conclusion. She uh, has announced that she's running in Brooks Medicine Hat. That's Barry Morishita's, the leader of the Alberta Party, Gwyneth Dirk, the Alberta NDP's candidate. I think I'm pronouncing her name wrong right here. Uh, she's a former, uh, she is a teacher, if I'm not mistaken, in the riding. I think, she, I think she's a retired teacher. Retired teacher. Um, this is rural Alberta. And yeah. the, this is not a riding that the uh, NDP or any party has won besides the PCs in some time. Is this just a cakewalk for Danielle? Because November 7th is a very quick turnaround time. This was one of her first orders that she announced uh, when she was sworn in as premier that this by-election was going to happen on the 7th and Elections Alberta wrote up the, or dropped the writ or issued the writ or however you want to pronounce that phrase uh, for November 7th, the day that she was sworn worn in is this quick turnaround time and she just wants to get this over with or was this was there some strategy behind this because everyone was looking at calgary elbow well, well yeah i think that i mean there's she, she wants to get elected the legislature she said that i mean it's a it's a, we're talking about a quick timeline it's she doesn't have a lot of time before the next election so if if she wants if the premier smith wants to get in and and implement some of her agenda. She said she wants to introduce the Alberta Sovereignty Act herself in the legislature. Well, she'll need a seat to do that. So they found a safe seat for her to run in. And, and uh, Brooks Medicine Hat is considerably safer for the UCP than Calgary Elbow, where, you know, she might not win or she'd have a competition on her hands, uh, you know, a real competition. Um, with, with Brooks Medicine Hat, I don't expect that the Premier will have too hard a time getting, getting elected. If she does, it's going to be a big it's going to be a big surprise um you know she's facing you know the NDP have a candidate in 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 Gwendolyn Dirk Gwendolyn the Albert Gwendolyn yeah and they and the Alberta party has has their leader who's running um in, who's the former mayor of Brooks um so he'll have some cachet and some support some personal support in that riding we'll see if it's enough it's a it's a big riding um it is rural but it also has some you know pretty significant urban components I think a third of the a third of the polls in the riding are in the city of Medicine Hat, which is the, I think, the eighth largest city in the province. So, you know, urban or suburban uh, um, uh, type voters. Um, so it is rural in, in terms of, you know, geographically, most of the riding is rural. And, and, uh, and most of the, 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 uh, the people who vote in the riding, I think, are, are, uh, are, would consider themselves or might consider, consider themselves rural, but it does have some urban components to it. So, but it is a, it's a safe UCP seat. It's going to be um, shocking if, if if Daniel Smith doesn't win by a big margin. I, I just want to see who comes in second, because if the mm -hmm. Alberta party in uh, Barry Morishita place a strong second place, uh, that gives them a little bit of a sale going into the election to say, hey, look, we are a viable option, and maybe make people may start coming out. I know they did cancel their AGM up in Edmonton mm -hmm. because of the by-election. Uh, the NDP are still going ahead with theirs in Calgary next weekend. And then the UCP are literally meeting next weekend as well. I want to talk yeah. about the press. I, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say, I don't, I, I, it's hard to say how much to read into the results. I mean, if Barry, Barry Morishita does play second, I mean, does that mean the Alberta party has support or does it mean Barry, Barry Morishita has support because this is his riding and he did serve as mayor. So you have to be careful not to read too much into by-elections because sometimes they mean a lot and sometimes they don't really mean much. Um, but it and, gives uh, them something to brag about, right? It gives them sure. a good oh, yeah. news story of, for at least a yeah. week to go out of that campaign and say, okay, we may not have won, but we got 30% of the vote or 10% of the vote or 15% of the vote, right? Yeah, yeah. 
I want to talk sure. about the press conference, the press conference on Tuesday, which led to, well, <laughs> national news and more international news. And it came late in the press conference. I think, uh, uh, I, I forget her, the reporter's name, uh, Miss Tate uh, asked directly. Carrie Tate. Carrie Tate. I, I want to say yeah. Connie Tate, but I was like, it's not Connie Tate. Uh, Carrie Tate asked the question to the premier and the premier said that the unvaccinated were the most discriminated people that she had ever seen in her life, which caused um, kind of a big uproar across Canada and in, on social media. And you know, you should always believe what social media says, and it should always be the pulse of Can- uh, the, what's going on in the real world. But it did make the rounds. Um, she came out with an apology, non-apology the day after. What'd you take on that? What's your take on what happened in that? Uh, is this just Daniel Smith being Daniel Smith and the shock talk radio star coming out of uh, the woodworks? Or is this just a first timers flub being the new premier? No, I, I, I mean, I think it was a, it, we're still talking about it and it's, <laughs> it's, it's like two days later. Uh, and she had to initiate, you know, she issued a, a, a correction statement the uh, you know the the next day which basically kept this story open you know alive for another entire news cycle so i don't think it's great it doesn't look great for the premier i mean she's speaking to a uh, a group of people who came out and supported her in droves in the leadership race uh and i have no there's no indication that is not something that she actually believes i mean that she said it she may have issued a correction she didn't issue an apology um but i think it's probably uh, uh gives us a bit of insight into her thinking around uh, around pub- public, around healthcare, around public health, and around you know who the real, who who she may be- believe the real victims of the uh, of the COVID pandemic were were not the the five thousand Albertans who died or their friends and family, but the people who, you know, the small percentage of Albertans who didn't go and get vaccinated. And I, you know, there's a we, we is this, this the battle the we're pandemic. seeing? Is this the battle we're going to see in 2023? To be honest, oh. because we are seeing we, we saw the report, I think it was out of uh, Calgary Herald or Calgary Sun this morning, where mm-hmm. Daniel Smith's path to victory is lose some seats in Calgary and win like trounce the other parties in rural Alberta and don't worry about Edmonton because she can win with a majority if she has a few seats in Calgary and the rest in rural Alberta. So is this the path that we are seeing that is going to play out in front of our eyes in the 2023 election? It, it, it looks like that. And if she's going to be talking about COVID and relitigating the COVID, uh, COVID pandemic and, and the public health measures, I mean, I think they will lose seats in the next election because I don't think that's where Albertans are. I think, you know, in terms of the, the, the issues that Albertans have at the, at the top of their minds, you know, we're talking about the economy, inflation, people talk about inflation till, you know, <laughs> till, uh, till the end, but, um, uh, you know, education, healthcare. These are really what Albertans, and we've seen this in polling, uh, you know, this is really where, where Albertans are in terms of their priorities. I think a lot of people are, you know, COVID was a very traumatic experience in a lot of different ways for a lot of people. And uh, I think generally people want to move as far past it as possible and try to get back to regular li- their regular lives and, and rebuild. Um, so if the, if the premier wants to run the next election on COVID, uh, you know, I think that her audience is going to be shrinking. We, uh, I'm not sure, I shouldn't say we, I say should say I. I've been noticing on social media through her outlets and through her uh, posts, and I should say her staff's posts, because I'm assuming she's not sitting there in front of Twitter every day and tweeting like Donald Trump. But mm-hmm. you are seeing connection to the Pierre Polyev camp. You are seeing the same phrases, the same key messaging. We saw uh, this morning as recording this that she posted something about tying Notley to Jugment Singh and Trudeau and tripling, tripling, tripling the uh, carbon uh, levy or the carbon uh, tax. And we are seeing a more friendlier premier to the federal counterpart because I didn't see as big of a friendly relationship with Aaron O'Toole and Jason Kenney. Yes, they did endorse each other, but they weren't copying each other's messaging. Are we seeing Mm -hmm. a more unified conservative movement in Alberta than we have in the past? Yeah, I think I think you'll see that. uh, And we saw this during her victory speech on election on uh, on the leadership election night, talking (laughs) about talking about inflation, talking about kind of using some a little, you know, a few of these key talking points, similar talking points that we've heard uh, Pierre probably have used. 
um, to some to apparently some success or as we've seen in the polls um, federally. Uh, so I, I mean, I could see that they're going to they're going to try to tap in on the same issues. I mean, there's also a lot of connections between the federal conservatives and the UCP. They are very similar parties. It's large, you know, a, a lot of cases, it's the same groups of people who are the same volunteers, the same groups of people who are going back and forth between the two parties. Um, I mean, you didn't see a lot of a lot, a lot of uh, glad having between Jason Kenney and Aaron O'Toole. I mean, I think O'Toole really, when he became, after he became leader and what, after he won the federal leadership race, he really tried to take a different track. And remember, going into the 2021, 2021, 2021 federal election, we have so many federal elections. Uh, you know, I mean, Jason Kenney's popularity was in the tank and he was toxic. And whereas the previous election in 2019, Kenny was in Ontario, he was in Manitoba campaigning on the ground with conserv federal conservative candidates for, for uh, Andrew Scheer's uh, federally led conservative party. He was nowhere. He basically disappeared for the entire federal campaign because there was no benefit for, uh, for Aaron O'Toole to be seen anywhere, cl anywhere close to Jason Kenney in, during the, the 2021 election. I think it'll be different. I mean, it could be different during the, uh, during the next federal election. We'll see how much of a, you know how much of a how much Daniel Smith's uh, agenda resonates with with Albertans and resonates with uh, people outside Alberta as well because people are you know the rest of the country is paying attention to what happens in Alberta despite you know the the constant talking points about conservative talking points you hear about oh, Albertans Alberta is ignored Alberta has to ask permission to you know from Ottawa to do stuff we're we're never we're not we're, you know we're we're not really ignored politically because we're so interesting. We, At least not recently. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Um, like, it seems like it's been a month in politics, but it's only been a week. And we saw Danielle Smith and her team, Premier Smith and her team, already start walking back the Sovereignty Act. And this is the big thing that won her this election. And that's my, that's my opinion. That's the hill I'm willing to die mm -hmm. on. But that Sovereignty Act is the one thing that people resonated to because she kept on talking about it. Her advisors, Rob Anderson, former MLA, said, we will respect what the Supreme Court says. But during the campaign, they were like, no, we're going to not uh, do anything that the federal government oversteps their constitutional authority on. Uh, we saw the Sovereignty Act scrubbed from their website. Thank God for the Wayback Machine, where you can actually go back and check it out and see what it's all about and screenshot it, what it's all about and her policies around it. Um, is this Danielle Smith lightening up for a more moderate urban base? I I. I... I mean, I don't know. <laughs> we'll have to, well, I don't know. I mean, we'll have to see. I mean, it's different than what, what, what they were saying last week. So, you know, we'll have to see when they introduce the bill in the legislature and, and, and what, uh, what, what that looks like. And then if they're, if they're, uh, their talking points change going into the next election. I mean, uh, Danielle Smith is a, despite the, 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 the flub in the first couple of days, I mean, Danielle Smith is a very skilled communicator and, you know, she's, she's been in politics before this. She was in, she was an MLA. She was a leader of the opposition. She spent years in the, in media, years in talk radio. And uh, she can come across as very, as sounding very reasonable and sounding like she's engaging and connect and, and be engaging and, and connect with people, especially, especially one-on-one. -on -one. So I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't underestimate her in turn. I think that's a, you know, I don't, I don't know if anybody is, but um, you know, anybody who thinks that it's a it's a slam dunk for the NDP going into the next election just because Danielle Smith is is leader of uh, of the UCP should really, really give their head a shake because she is a she is a skilled politician and and uh, and quite a good communicator. So is Rachel Notley. And I think that's what will make the next election and the next uh, six months. Actually, I'm just going to call the next six months the election because that's basically what we're gonna, where, where we're going to be. Um, uh, so it'll be interesting to see how she you know, whether she walks the Alberta Sovereignty Act back to where it was uh, when she was campaigning. I don't think she lost any votes or she's going to lose any support among her uh, among her supporters. I think they they know that she's one of them and that uh, they at this point, I think they trust her to uh, to fulfill her promises that she made on the campaign trail. And I don't see any indication that she won't. I mean, I think there's a lot there's some messaging that's going on, but um, uh, I, I don't see any indication that she's going to really back down.
Um, while this is going to be a shorter episode than usual for our listeners, uh, because uh, Dave has graciously accepted to come on for a quick uh, chat on this, I want to turn to a topic that we're going to be talking about later on this month, and that is cabinet. Cabinet, cabinet, cabinet. Um, Daniel Smith has said, we're going to take away that set, uh, Calgary-centric viewpoint and give more cabinet roles basically to rural MLAs. Um, Rebecca Schultz, Rajan Sani, um, mm-hmm. Travis Taves, Leela here, and Brian Jean, and even Todd Lowen. Can these people expect to see a cabinet position or are we going to see some relatively new faces to cabinet that even Jason Kenny was overlooking? I, I'm sure there'll be a mix. I mean, she said but during during the leadership race that there was a spot in her cabinet. There would be a spot in her cabinet for all the leadership, all the, all the other leadership candidates. Uh, it'll be just interesting to see where those spots are, where those spots are. Um, uh, and I think we'll see some new, I mean, we'll see some new people. We'll see some, she has to work with the caucus that she has. And does Taves go back to finance with the rigmarole that was going on during one of the debates about the PST and uh, financial issues? Does Taves go back to finance or does he get a, and I'm going to say this as politely as possible, a demotion? Well, I think anything, I mean, finance is always kind of seen as the second in, you know, second in command of the uh, of, of the cabinet and, uh, you know, right below the premier. Uh, whether it is or not, it, it seems politically that's where that's where it lives. Um, so, I mean, anything less than finance is a demotion. Um, I could see her keeping Travis Taves as finance minister for the next six months. Um, he did place, you know, a very strong second in the sixth ballot of the UCP leadership race. Uh, he presented a surplus budget in 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 the spring this year. I mean, a surplus budget that had had a lot to do or almost everything to do with oil and gas revenues and the international price of oil. Uh, but uh, I mean, that'll be a, that'll be one of the uh, the UCP's really strong weapons going into the next election is the ability to table a a budget in the spring with with a big surplus and be able to you know, hand out big checks and, and make lots of promises and, and do things that, uh, that uh, Alberta governments do when, uh, when they're rolling in the oil money. Who are you um, looking so at? S- oh, go ahead. Continue. Oh, no, I was going to say, so I could see him staying as finance minister. Who are you looking at for the rural MLAs that potentially people haven't even thought about for a cabinet position? Because I can imagine that Jason Nixon or yeah, Jason Nixon is probably not mm-hmm. going to be back into a portfolio after his comments on the sovereignty act during the leadership campaign he did stay neutral but he did sort of walk out and talk to the media about it people in caucus would just wouldn't vote for it uh who are you looking at in this cabinet shuffle or this new smith cabinet that's going to be unveiled that later next week well looking at the candidate looking at the mlas who endorsed her and i think there were only eight or nine or, nine or ten mlas who of, of the in the ucp caucus who actually endorsed her i'm looking at people like i mean it's like the people who are already in cabinet so mike ellis uh nate glubish uh casey madu um uh looking at mlas like nathan newdorf from lethbridge east <laughs> that's right lethbridge east who is who endorsed her uh even someone like former agriculture minister devin dreeshan who uh, who endorsed her? Who is kind of under you know been under his own cloud of controversy for the past uh, past Does Pat Wren get was, something? He was kicked out of cabinet. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, is is he here or is he in Texas? <laughs> or Red Deer, one or the other, <laughs> or 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 one or the other. I don't I I don't know. I think I'm I'm going to be interested to see how she handles Pat Wren because uh, uh, he. Uh, he really embarrassed the uh, the Kenny government with uh, with his actions, and even though he was let back in, uh, you know it's uh, uh, you know he's still pretty pretty far back in the back benches as far as I'm aware. So we'll, you know we'll see how many of the uh, how many of the MLAs who endorsed uh, endorsed Smith get elevated to cabinet or given some other positions, committee chair chairmanships or uh, parliamentary secretaries, and and if Smith wants to keep those roles, uh, keep the parliamentary secretary roles, which. Uh, Jason Kenny was in, in his last year was was handing out quite uh, quite quickly to uh, to uh, keep his caucus appeased. Um, I want to turn to our last subject here, and that is what's next. We are all eyes are going to be on Brooks Medicine Hat right now for this by election. We have cabinet next week. What are you looking forward? We are one week in. We got 
six more months until the next election or <laughs> however long until the next election, what are you looking at and what are you looking at politically for both parties, the NDP and the UCP? Well, I'm looking, I mean, the first thing is, is something that I follow quite closely is nominations and looking at, uh, you know, the NDP have been nominating candidates quite quickly. They seem to be preparing, you know, they want to be ready if the premier calls an early election, and I think they have 55 or 56 candidates nominated, they have a whole bunch of candidate nominations uh, scheduled for the next few weeks. Um, they're going to have people lined up, in, in, and especially in the ridings that, uh, that they believe they can win in the next election or have a shot at winning. The UCP is quite far behind. I think they have about 35 or 36 candidates nominated. They were nominating throughout the leadership race, but then about a month ago, they pause nominations to focus on, I, mean, I imagine the party infrastructure was pretty busy uh, uh, with the processing the uh, the leadership ballots. Um, but I expect that they'll start uh, start up their nominations quite quickly. And uh, it'll be very interesting to see who steps forward to run for the UCP, which UCP MLAs decide not to run again. And, uh, you know, when she announces her new cabinet on the 21st, uh, you might get an indication of, uh, of who might you know, who is not in the cabinet or no longer in the cabinet uh, and who might be considering their uh, their options for the fall. And I expect they'll have to make their decisions pretty quickly because the party will be opening up uh, opening up nominations. And the 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 second thing I'm watching is uh, is uh, that uh, that weekend, the uh, the dueling conventions, the UCP are having their annual convention at uh, the River Cree Resort on the Enoch First Nation, just west of Edmonton, and um, the NDP are having their uh, their convention at the, uh, I think at the Hyatt in downtown Calgary. Uh, so it'll be very interesting just what to watch the town, uh, you know, what's happening at those conventions, what to, where the members are, whether the, I mean whether there's any interesting policies or, or insurgent uh, insurgent groups within the party that are that are trying to get attention and and who shows up um, at the at the two conventions and then of course the speeches from the leaders because I'm looking at these two conventions as really the campaign kickoffs for uh, for the next election and it's no mistake or no no uh, um, no uh, uh, what's the word um, uh, no coincidence, pardon me, that uh, that the NDP convention is being held in Calgary this year because that's really where the NDP feel the battleground is, uh, and um, and uh, that's where they, that's where they feel their their path to victory is is in the next election. And uh, a lot of in a lot of ways, the UCP's um, path to stopping the NDP from forming government in the next election is also in Calgary. Uh, so uh, so it'll be very interesting to see what uh, you know what comes out of those two conventions, who shows up, and what the what the leaders say because it is kind of a debut for. Uh, I mean, Danielle Smith, obviously, is not her her first uh, introduction to the UCP uh, membership, but it is a kind of her big debut as as, uh, as premier in terms of the big party function after the uh, or the biggest party function after the uh, after the leadership race. You you talk about nominations. Correct me if I'm wrong, because you paid a little bit more attention to this than probably I did. But Daniel Smith during the leadership campaign said that she would hold open nominations for some of the nominations that had already taken place for the UCP. Correct. Well, I think what she said was that if Riding's request for the nominations to be reopened, she would reopen them. So if the boards requested the nominations okay. to be reopened, and I think specifically what she was talking about were the nominations in Rock, uh, Rimby Rocky Mountain House Sundry, which is represented by um, Jason Jared, Nixon Jason. and, uh, pardon me? Jason Nixon, the guy that we just talked about 10 seconds. Yeah, Jason Nixon, exactly. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I thought I missed something. Uh, and uh, and Carts and Sixica, which is, uh, which is held by Joseph Shaw. And both of those MLAs are, uh, were uh, very strong Kenny loyalists, and they were both facing big nomination challenges in uh, uh, a couple months ago over the summer and in the spring. And there was a lot of indication that, uh, or a lot of talk that their opponents had sold enough memberships to either defeat them or pose a significant challenge. And then it, the party disqualified their opponents. And it was seen as uh, the party, Kenny, uh, Kenny controlled party protecting Kenny's loyalists when he needed them in the uh, in in the caucus. And there was, I know there was a lot of disgruntlement among the members who and the, and the activists um, who were organizing against the MLAs, and they turned their attention to uh, defeating Kenny in the leadership review, which they, I guess, they kind of did, or they they knocked him down enough that he had to resign. And then they, I, I expect a lot of them went out and supported Daniel Smith in the, uh, in the leadership race. So I think they'll be looking to her to reopen nominations in these writings. And if that's the case, 
you might see one or two of them uh, of the MLAs uh, decide not to run again or not to contest again. I, I want to ask one last question. I know that was going to be the last <laughs> one, but this one. Um, Danielle Smith, during her first press conference, Premier Smith, during her first press conference on Tuesday, said that she had not talked to former Premier Jason Kenney at all during the transition period. Now, we all remember that great photo of Rachel Notley and Jason Kenney standing side by side, walking out of the government house after talking. We remember Jim Prentice and Rachel Notley doing the same thing. I'm not sure if Jim Prentice did it with Dave Hancock or Hancock did it with, well, Hancock and Redford did it on the, in the stairs of the legislature, but- Under diff different circumstances. <laughs> exactly. Um, Jason Kenney has been not heard or seen of since uh, last Thursday. Is he done? Is he, because uh, Premier Smith sort of alluded to that there may be more opening vacancies here shortly. Is Jason Kenney getting ready to ride off into political obscurity and the history books of Alberta um, not staying on much longer during this Smith era of politics? I don't expect we're going to hear much from Jason Kenney, the uh, the MLA for Calgary Lougheed, um, at least in the not in the next little bit. And it's probably appropriate for him to take a step back. Um, you know, he went he was very busy in his last two weeks as as premier. Uh, the uh, I've never seen a government move. So, you know, make so many announcements. I think there was one point where they sent out like 17 press releases in one day or something like that. And he was making, you know, he wasn't disappearing. Uh, during his final days, I mean, up until this last uh, last up until the morning of the leadership race, uh, he was still out making making announcements, holding press conferences. Um, so, you know, I mean, he obviously had a lot of things. Many of these things probably were probably in the works before these two weeks, these two weeks happened. But, uh, um, you know, I mean, it seemed like he wanted to keep himself busy or he had a list of things he wanted to check off or or, you know, maybe he maybe this is how he indicated to his staff this is how he wanted to go out was would just be making a ton of announcements and and uh and and keeping busy for and not having time to really uh sit and stew on on his uh you know his his political legacy and the uh, and the leadership race that uh that may or may not be tearing his legacy uh apart so i thought it was interesting that that uh, premier smith said that she hadn't been able to talk to him that she'd reached out to him and i she kind of said, indicated that he wasn't taking her calls, um, which was kind of strange because he tweeted something on on the leadership election night saying that, uh, you know, he promised an orderly change of government, which was kind of a weird thing to say, uh, because why wouldn't there be an orderly change of government? And also it's the same party. Like, this isn't like, you know, the NDP have just won an election and there's a complete turnover. Like in a lot of cases, it's all this, it's a lot of the same people. And we've seen this as Daniel Smith announced her transition team and some of some of the senior staffers, you know, these are a lot of people. I mean, a lot of these people are, some of them are Daniel Smith people, but it's, these are people from other, other campaigns. They're people who've worked in these roles before or been in the premier's office before or been in, in cabinet or cabinet offices before. So um, yeah, it's strange. I mean, I, I don't really begrudge the guy for kind of taking a step back. I mean, what would Jason Kenney do this week? Um, I mean, he did a bunch of media interviews nationally last over the, I think over the weekend or at the, at the end of last week, um, talking about the conservative movement. But, um, uh, you know, maybe he's just taking some time and maybe he's on, <laughs> he's on vacation, but uh, there'll be a spot for him in the legislature, I'm sure, when he, if he, if he doesn't resign. I mean, they usually put the premier's in the back beside the speaker so they don't have to walk across this across uh when the uh, when the when the current premier is talking on in on camera you don't see the the former premier kind of walking head down behind them um so they put them right by the door so they can have can get in and out really easy and, and there's no camera angles that can catch them um but uh but i don't expect we'll be hearing too much i you know it'll be interesting to see if he does say something about the alberta sovereignty act because if he is an mla he also spoke out against it and said it would make banana uh, make banana make alberta look like a banana republic so um it'll be interesting to see whether if he uh if he stands on uh, stands behind those words when it's actually introduced in the legislature true that well dave i want to thank you so much for sitting down with us quickly today and talking about the last week in politics we will have you back on to talk about premier smith's first cabinet unveiling later on this month so thank you so much for coming in and sitting down today 
Excellent. Thank you so much, Chris. This has been uh, a lot of fun and I'm yeah. looking forward to uh, <laughs> to what comes in the next two weeks. There you go. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. And this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. Keep talking, everyone. And remember, subscribe to YouTube wherever you get the podcast as well. But this has been a YouTube exclusive. So subscribe to the YouTube channel. Thanks so much. and Have yourself an excellent day, guys. Thank you.